pleasure to be back and see all these familiar faces and uh, I hope we'll have a uh, time to reconnect and talk about uh, lots of different things. Uh, I try to invite uh, as many people as I can to Las Vegas so you know what happens in Las Vegas, but not all of you can come. So I came here to tell you what's happening in Las Vegas. And since I'm going to talk about it, why don't I tell you all about it? So I'm going to give you an overview what uh, my group has been doing over the last uh, several years. Uh, some of you will recognize that the subjects or ideas that I will talk about, I uh, talked to you during my sabbatical year, which was three years ago, which was a great time. And some of the things are quite ancient, but still relevant. Actually, I would like to dedicate this uh, talk to uh, Professor uh, George Field, who is not here, but Harvard professor, because this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of his important paper on thermal instability, which is very relevant to the subject of um, my talk. So I have very many collaborators that I would like to thank for their contributions. Jim Stone, Tim Kalman from Goddard, Mitch Bigelman, Jerry Ostreicher, uh, Stuart Sim, who is at Queen's, Mer uh, Queen's University Belfast, my uh, colleague Ken Naganini, um, former student or postdocs uh, here at Princeton, Yancey Zhang and Shane Davis, my graduate student uh, Tim uh, Waters, and a, a number of uh, former postdocs, Paramita Barre, Ruichi Kurosawa, Monika Mościbrodska, uh, Ahmed Kashi, and an undergraduate student, uh, Daniel Smith, and many more. So that is uh, my habit to spend uh, most of my time talking about the title, because I try to uh, have a title that will be uh, informative. So I'm going to talk about physics, uh, of what's going on inside the active galactic nuclei. Okay, this is in the context of inner working of AGN and also in the context of so-called AGN feedback. Uh, we've been observed, uh, uh, in quasars for a long time. Quasars were discovered uh, on, uh, also 50 years ago or so, but we still don't understand what's going on um, in great detail, enough uh, detail to have, for example, a physical model f uh, for um, our measurements of black hole masses. I will not talk about magnetic fields, in part because quasars are so bright that uh, we can see them when, uh, when they are even very far. So radiation is very important. We see outflow of radiation in the form of electromagnetic radiation, and we, we have good reason to believe that matter is escaping as well. So <coughs> another context of my talk is uh, black uh, hole physics. So it's concerned with formation and dynamics of, of so-called uh, broad line regions and narrow line regions, uh, mass supply to a black hole accretion flow, and black hole feedback. So I will give a, a bit of an introduction and then focus on two sets of uh, uh, problems. So we'll talk about a multidimensional time-dependent approach to study accretion disk wind. So that can be viewed as what is the physics of so-called subgrid physics. So if you are a galaxy formation person or a cosmologist, this is what you do, you that you cannot go down and resolve things on very small scales. You have to assume uh, something. Uh, and then also large-scale inflows and outflows. And that is in an attempt to see how far we can study uh, AGN feedback uh, directly without subgrid physics. And I will end with conclusion. So I took this slide from a paper with Luca Ciotti and Jerry Ostreicher where we talk about uh, AGN feedback. So I am not going to talk about all those phases about star formation and uh, cycle in galaxy evolution I will just focus on the very central part. And I will try to talk about what, is, what are the implications of what's going on at small scales uh, in uh, large scales. So we've seen cartoons like that many, many times. 
And this is basically one of the key motivations of my work, that we don't understand what are those clouds, where do they come from, why do they uh, uh, move so fast, what is their lifetime. So we, we have an accretion disk, we have a black hole, and within the grand unification scheme for AGN, what, what we see, it depends on the viewing angle. Some people uh, consider evolutionary effect as very important in this context. So drawing cartoons is a lot of fun, <laughs> and it is, of course, based on observations, but because we do not resolve those regions spatially, and probably will never do, we, we have to rely on well-known uh, physical pro uh, processes to understand what's going on. Okay? So because of the famous M sigma relationship and other things, people talk about AGN feedback a lot. Okay? So you have a black hole which is accreting matter and it's emitting radiation and there is an outflow. So this is a, an example of uh, something I refer to as inflows from outflows. Okay, but in many contexts, this is just subgrid physics. Okay, so where you have a feedback effect, right? So you have what centrifugal governor is that controls the way how energy is released and is done in such a way that the steam engine doesn't blow up, but you can safely travel a century ago, for example, from Boston to um, Colorado and then to Nevada. So we know how to engineer systems, how to control them, okay? How is it done, or how, I hope, used to be done in cosmological calculations? Well, two the relationships are being used. One is that the, you have a accretion rate, and then you have a limit at which at, uh, accretion, <coughs> uh, at which black, uh, and any gravitational source can accept matter, the so-called Eddington, limit, and you basically say, well, it cannot be higher than that. So the accretion rate, which is estimated by, <coughs> by so-called Bondi uh, uh, rate, on the black hole is either a Bondi rate or a Eddington rate, cannot be higher. Okay. Then once you have accretion rate, you can use some simple relationships, which is basically energy conservation, and say how much of that energy will be um, uh, released uh, by the system. Okay. So no matter what computational language you use, whether it's C++ or Fortran, you basically connect those things in a code so that once you know what is the accretion rate onto a black hole, you connect it to the energy that the will be escaping the black hole, and that energy then fits into the, um, the Bondi accretion rate. Bondi accretion rate is determined by the density of the matter at large distances and its temperature. So if you release of en a lot of energy, then the gas temperature at large radii goes up and accretion rate estimated by the Bondi formula goes down, so that reduces the accretion rate onto a black hole, that reduces the en energy, uh, uh, accretion energy, and that reduces that, so that allows this to go up. So this is how you do that. So there's no real physics b uh, behind it. There are lots of other things that are being ignored. For example, at what rate and where that energy is uh, connected with the material which is outside a uh, 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 black hole event horizon. And then even if you have uh, this accretion rate, you don't know how much of that energy is released in the form of electromagnetic radiation, how much it is released uh, in the form of magnetic energy. So this is why I think there is room for improvement. So the my, my point here is I'm focused on radiation-driven outflows because we see a lot of radiation emitted by quasars. Okay. So you can basically study this by solving um, equations of hydrodynamics or radiation hydrodynamics in two or three dimensions and allowing for time dependence. And you use numerical techniques. So as always, you have to define the 
the do uh, uh, computational domain that would be in this case the domain uh, which on uh, which has one boundary which is the accretion disk which is the source of material as well as the radiation and then you have rotational axis and what happens is that radiation esca escapes the photosphere of the disk and radiation can also enter the computational domain uh, through the um, through this boundary because you have a source of radiation near the black hole where you have corona where you produce a lot of x-rays so in this business you need to take into account uh, uh, um, the way uh, the processes related to radiation and matter interaction so line emission you have uh, free free emission compton heating and cooling x-ray uh, photoionization and recombination and then it's all done because you have sources of opacity electron scattering uh, x-ray opacity and uh, opacity related to uh, absorption lines so if you look at the phase diagram where you have the photoionization parameter and temperature with those processes included you end up with the equilibrium curve which is the solid line please ignore all the other things I will go back to this plot later and then <coughs> you know that depending on the slope on this diagram you have regions where gas is stable or unstable but what is relevant for th uh, this part is that as the photoionization parameter increases the uh, cross section or t uh, opacity in x-rays decreases and also opacity of lines which is here marked as blue as an illustration also decreases so you have a lot of opacity here then very little opacity here but when you are talking about Eddington uh, luminosity the classical definition is referring only to the uh, electrons uh, scattering which is frequency independent and once gas is uh, ionized it's also photonization dependent but you see that for uh, relatively uh, low photonization parameters, you have a lot of opacity in lines and somewhat in, in um, x-rays that you can have an outflow even though the system is sub-Eddington. So you, in, uh, uh, you have to take then into account interaction of photons with matter and also W uh, during which energy as well as momentum is transferred from radiation to matter okay so you solve equations of hydrodynamics and I will give you an example of what what might happen when you add the source term to the momentum equation when you include um, radiation through very many uh, spectral lines so th this treatment is based on well uh, studied and understood theory of outflows in OB stars so the main modification here when you apply it to quasars is that OB stars are round accretion disks are flat Our OB stars have relatively constant temperature throughout the photosphere in accretion disk temperature depends uh, on radius another thing you need to take into account that in OB stars you have ma main source of photons uh, coming uh, which is the uh, photosphere which is thermalized uh, material so you have mostly EUV and UV photons in uh, quasars you have uh, rad radiation uh, spectral energy distribution which is relatively flat so you have uh, a lot of pho UV photons which are good for driving but also x-ray which o can oven ionize just a very simple example I will change that in a slide or two okay so it's been a, a long-standing problem what will happen if you have that energy uh, when you allow for a photoionization the gas is expected to be over ionized so let's start uh, with uh, a simpler case where w w uh, what will happen if life was really easy okay then it is really easy you can end up with so-called bipolar outflow where most of the wind comes where most of the UV photons come so this is basically OB star analog okay so most of the matter escapes within uh, um, a, a hundred uh, 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 
between 100 and 500 black hole radii for the black hole mass 10 to the 8 and ending point fraction uh, 0.6. So that's very powerful. This wind is very fast, 20, 30,000 kilometers per second, carrying a, uh, with it a lot of energy and matter. But excuse me, this one here, <coughs> why there is no material here? Because when it is launched from the disk, it is rotating. So it is going up, there is a mismatch between gravity and centrifugal force, so streamlines bend up, okay? But it's, uh, uh, why don't I have an outflow here? It is because, as I mentioned earlier, the disk is launching material mostly when it produces UV photons. So this gas, uh, uh, gas at this radii is below 10,000 Kelvin, so there is uh, not much radiation and even less opacity. So there is very little being launched from that. Could you say it again? So what is the driving mechanism in the ki kinetic outflow? <laughs> well, th there are other types of outflow. And um, I'm just focusing on this to, uh, uh, to have a controlled, simple experiment. And they will talk about other types of outflows and how they interact. Oh, you are talking about jet? Okay, so uh, I am <coughs> talking about uh, quasars and, uh, and, and radio quiet systems. So I'm talking about uh, phenomena that we observed uh, in UV uh, spectra, like broad line regions, broad absorption line regions and uh, other types of outflow jets. These are the jets which are uh, uh, radio emission. This is probably where magnetic fields are uh, very important. Now, can magnetic fields drive outflows uh, responsible for broad absorption lines? Yes, it could be, but we have also radiation. So I, I'm trying to um, explain observations by uh, using magnetic driving is not, as, is not as straightforward because we don't know, we do not measure magnetic field strength and configuration. What we know uh, from observations, we know the spectrum of the source and luminosity of the source. So in calculations of this kind, when we need to specify certain things, we can specify it in the context of radiation driven models, uh, uh, those things uh, uh, being motivated by observation. I am not saying that uh, magnetic fields are unimportant. I'm just focusing on a simple case. So going back to Eve's uh, question, what if we will keep adding processes and allowing for the uh, f physically expected coupling? So what happens here is that you allow for gas heating and cooling, and that will change uh, this force and of course, we'll uh, be coupled back here because we will be changing density. So the next simulation starts from the last snapshot of the previous one when I turn on X-ray source coming from the corona and include this term. So then the problem of ionization is solved that indeed gas is over ionized, but this is just the gas which is the nearest to the black hole. Which is, the di which is directly exposed to the X-ray. However, further out, uh, gas sees the X-ray source through failed wind and sees this uh, radiation of lower magnitude and of different spectral energy distribution. Therefore, it can successfully escape. So this is basically self-shielding, that the innermost part of the outflow is overheated, fails, but the uh, uh, out, uh, uh, outflow coming from larger radii can survive. So it's a simple solution to the so-called over-ionization. Yes, that's right. So you take it out and That's right. I par so what, uh, 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 a bit more details on that. I am not uh, doing multi-frequency uh, uh, radiative transfer. 
I just do the simplest possible way. I just say out of total luminosity, F x is the fraction in x rays, F uv is in the uv. Because I would like results from this simulation to inform us about uh, what type of kinetic energy and uh, thermal energy can we use in our AGN feedback models. I want to trust these models, okay? One thing is certain, I do like them. But can we trust them? And the only way to do that is by computing spectra based on s simulations like that. So this is what I have been using, uh, doing for a number of years. These flows are very dynamic. That's another uh, uh, way of showing the results I just showed you. The, ones that th the one before it was in Cartesian coordinate system. This is how it is actually done in the code when you have logarithmic spacing in radius and theta. So th you see this failed wind. And you see the wind further out, which is escaping. You can take this data and calculate spectra using Monte Carlo simulations. This is what I've uh, done in collaboration with Stuart Sim. You can pick different uh, uh, viewing angles and calculate the uh, ups, up, uh, transmitted and scattered radiation and calculate the net radiation at different uh, frequencies. So this is basically an uh, attempt to com uh, co test the models with observations. So I also done it with my former uh, uh, postdoc, Nick Higginbotham, so that we can say, can this model account for the width of the lines, the strength of the lines, both in emission and in radiation? So then later, when I will say this mass loss rate is such and such, or luminosity, kinetic luminosity is such and such, I can trust it. Why? Because these models predict spectra which are consistent with observations. Mass loss rates and uh, 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 rates at which energy is carried by outflows cannot be determined uh, directly from observations because we don't know the opening angle, we don't know the filling uh, factor, we don't know the covering factor. Yes, that's right. So these are very sophisticated Monte Carlo simulations that do not only uh, follow the photons, but uh, uh, so this is not only f uh, radiative transfer technique, it is also photonization. This is using Leon Lutwitz tec uh, uh, techniques of calculating photonization uh, using Monte Carlo techniques. These are actually much more time consuming calculations than the hydro because they take weeks. The, the hydro calculations take, you know. So this is all post-processing. Yes, I, I, will I will show you a bit more examples from my own work. So this is, you know, for me it is my millennium simulation. This I've done a long time ago, but for all those years in between, I've been calculating spectra using different methods. So this is something I do I've done in 2004. I calculated carbon four uh, line profile. Black shows the pure absorption and uh, uh, dashed line is absorption with emission as a function of inclination angle. And it is basically a broad emission line and if you are looking at the source through the fast wind, you see something that uh, resembles a uh, P-signy-like line profile. In interpreting observations uh, with Sloan, uh, if having, uh, uh, you, al you, um, you also want to see how those line profiles will vary with time. So I'm also trying to do that. So th uh, this is to be able to uh, con uh, study time variability uh, that is uh, uh, being uh, carried out by people like ne uh, Neil Brandt, who is using Sloan and has a lot of data f uh, from uh, different e epochs. So what was the year that you were calculating? That was very, very short. The year is over there. So we are talking about here uh, 
but this is just an illustration that we are able to do it. I'm, because this is just pure absorption, this is very easy to do. There's more work needed to be done. As far as interpreting the data, this is something that I like to show is many people, but in particular Nahum Arab is emphasizing the fact that when we interpret the absorption lines in quasars, we need to account for so-called velocity dependent covering factor. That depending on the, <coughs> on the velocity, a position a, a within the absorption line, the covering factor can be small and can be very large. So what do I have here is I have a snapshot taken from the simulations and I calculated only absorption and uh, a line profile and I marked with the uh, uh, vertical lines three uh, velocities and here I'm showing the projected disk uh, intensity including the resonance surface where continuum photons emitted by this surface are in resonance with the wind at those three frequencies. So this is the, uh, the right hand side is near the line center, the left hand side is fur furthest to the blue. So, and it, you see that the stronger the absorption, the larger the uh, resonance surface, meaning that it's covering larger fraction of the UV source. So here we have, <coughs> so the basically the, th this is in another context, which is the context that observers interpret outflows uh, ref uh, uh, using terms like clouds. And I will go back to that. What do we mean by a cloud? It is uh, really a region of much higher density than the surrounding, or it could be a a region which, is, which has a density more or less the same as surrounding, but dramatically different uh, optical properties. In particular, it could be in a resonance or it could be not. It could have a certain ioniz uh, uh, ioniz it can be at a certain ionization state or not. So th this is at the uh, s 70 uh, degrees inclination angle. So we are looking at the disk like so. <coughs> so if you an observer flying nearby an object like that and you are looking down the disk, you will s uh, at the given frequency, you see, you will uh, be under impression that there are clouds, quote unquote, between you and the disk. So how Provided that we trust those results, can we, how can we use them? Well, you can talk to Jerry Ostrecker here, but uh, an idea is this. You basically calculate mass loss rates as a function of accretion rate for a given uh, mass of the accretor. And what we found, that there's a nice scaling similar to the one discovered by Castro Abbott and Klein in, in the 70s, that it's a power law. With the clear cutoff, so when you have lines you can have an outflow even if you are sub Eddington, but if the luminosity is low enough, even uh, uh, millions uh, uh, of lines will not be enough to provide you uh, with enough opacity to overcome gravity. The maximum so-called force multiplier, the m uh, largest enhancement that you can count on in this context is of order of two, three thousand. That's right, so if you calculate total line opacity and then you divide it by Thomson's cr cross-section, then you end up with about 2,000. But that number, this high number, is only when the ionization is, uh, is not too high. Because if that number goes, uh, if ionization increases, that number decreases. That's another way of looking at the so-called over-ionization problem. So the UV uh, uh, continuum is calculated uh, in my cal uh, uh, models using Shakura-Sunyaev model. 
So in this context, that, uh, 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 what you need to know is the mass of the accretor and, and accretion rate. You do not need uh, 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 to assume any alpha because that, that is a purely ed energetical uh, argument. For the X-rays, I assume that it comes from a spherical source, like a corona. So it's, it's basically a point source, central point source. Yes, it's very small. So point source meaning that I do not resolve uh, uh, its size. That's right. It, that's right. So another way of looking at it from the point of view of the wind, UV is like the intrinsic radiation. It comes from the local photosphere. X-ray radiation, it, you can view it as e external irradiation. However, when we do it using Monte Carlo calculations, what we find is that scattered light is very important. So although uh, uh, column density along a given line of sight can be high, you can ionize gas behind the shield by multiple scattering that basically goes around the shield. Excuse me? Oh, this is this is Eddington fraction, and ignore those. This is just 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 uh, uh, this is to be honest, taken from uh, applications in cataclysmic variables. But the I the physics is the same. What is important here is that this is the uh, this dependence that it's a power law on luminosity. So gamma in this context is so-called Eddington uh, ratio, which is the actual luminosity divided by Eddington luminosity. So, uh, Professor Ostreicher and his collaborators have used uh, in their calculations insights <coughs> from simulations like that, when you can scale uh, uh, outflow mass loss rate with the uh, luminosity. Now, I do not want to criticize people who uh, use uh, um, um, uh, subgrid physics because I asked my former postdoc Ahmed Kashi to create this, which is a schematic picture of what's going on in typical cosmological simulations using gadget or any other. It is very complicated. You need to cut corners here and there, otherwise you won't be able to do any of these calculations. What I want to say is that I see my work in this context in this simple way. I want to inform them about this little engine here and the controller. Okay. And what you need to say is not only that uh, you know it's not uh, irrational or irrational to do it. Uh, the logic is also irrational. That's right. So I don't have a slide with that, but th th that can be determined without any simulations using the following physical arguments. You identify the innermost radius where disk is still bright in the UV. So let's say where the disk lumina uh, temperature is uh, 50,000 K. And then you calculate what is the escape velocity from that location, and you multiply it by a factor of two or three, and that would be a good proxy for the terminal velocity of the outflow launched from that location. Right. So basically, you do the two dots go to one dot zero. Right. So yes, for UV photons can drive an outflow from the uh, place where they are coming from, which is the photosphere. Can the same UV photons and X-rays drive an outflow from uh, regions <coughs> further out? I, I keep showing this because. We know that radiation produced at the visceral center has to escape the, in the uh, most part, escape the galaxy and reach us. So it is encountering photons on its way out. So being very simple, you can ask the following. If you have a black hole and you don't have rotation and you have spherically symmetric gas, then you end up with this uh, uh, one-dimensional steady state Bondi solution. When you have just gas at the given temperature uh, and density, 
and then you have a source of gravity somewhere at the center. But what will happen when you allow radiation from the source to escape, heat up the gas? So that would be so-called thermal driving, okay, or energetical feedback. Now, it is not enough to say how much energy is emitted by the quasar, because we need to know where this energy will be captured, at what wavelengths, at what uh, radii, because this will determine what would be the density of the material which is slowed down and maybe eventually uh, uh, expelled. So you solve, so, uh, solve the same equation, and now I'm doing the other way around. For the moment, I am ignoring momentum transfer. I'm just focusing on heating and cooling. This problem has been uh, worked on by many people in the 70s and 80s, including Professor Ostreicher, but also uh, uh, Julian Krolig and others, when they looked about a problem of what, how the bond of solution changes when, when you heat up the gas self-consistently. This uh, early calculations were one-dimensional and um, show that if you heat up um, uh <coughs> enough, you basically produce an outflow instead of inflow. We've redone those calculations, but now in 2D, and what we found is that when you lo have luminosity very low, so this is uh, uh, five times ten to, uh, uh, 10 to negative four, you basically recover Bondi solution. But as you increase luminosity, little by little, you find that initially there is some time-dependent transient event. But at some point, we couldn't find a steady state solution. We found actually solution which was uh, frequency, uh, sorry, resolution dependent. That's why you have different colors and even oscillation. For this particular uh, example, it was just 1D as if Bondi. Just 1D radial solution, just exploratory. What is to expect? How th this was actually the phase where we were trying to uh, understand what are the basic requirements to get it right. And it was already very hard <laughs> because of that. Okay, I will show two-dimensional, three-dimensional uh, 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 examples of that in a minute. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, nothing really strange. If you go back to the basic physics, we have a certain heating and cooling curve that gives you certain equilibrium solution, which in certain part is unstable according to uh, uh, George Field's criteria for thermal instability. Okay, so I see that there are some students of Professor Field uh, here, uh, or students of the students. So what do we have? Is that you have the red, which is the ra radiative equilibrium solution, and then what do you do? You are at the equilibrium, you po and then you perturb. And you have choices. You can perturb assuming constant density or constant pressure. And uh, Field's theory is to tell us that there are certain circumstances in astrophysics that when you perturb keeping pressure constant, okay? So on this diagram, following this line, slope of one, there are regions where this slope is less than the slope of the equilibrium curve, that's a geometrical interpretation, where gas is unstable. This is the curve for the free-falling adiabatic gas, which in our context is very relevant. Okay, so Monika Mościbrodzka, and myself, we went through all the processes that we have, Bremsstrahlen photonization, and we found that for the model where we reach the steady state, when the luminosity is low, we have sonic point. Very far, so the, where the gas formerly is unstable, it's supersonic. Therefore, the stretching due to uh, differential acceleration is enough to overcome the gas natural tendency to condensate. However, if the luminosity is very high, the sonic point moves inwards, and where the gas is unstable, which is marked over here, the gas is subsonic. So the, then it's not in a free fall, and this uh, stretching is uh, not as um, important, and gas is unstable. So 
in our basic requirements, there is no point for us to increase the resolution. This is basically physically unstable. Okay? This is my way of not giving you a chance to ask the question, is it a numerical effect? Well, this is a physical effect. Okay? So you can do, uh, do it much more formally, calculate the growth rate and finding where they are negative, where they are positive. I don't want to go into the detail, but we have confirmed that this is basically uh, when the time scale for growth is uh, shorter than for the flow to accrete, we find oscillation. Okay. So ba if you look at the simple condensation mode, when, you w you when the gas is unstable, you reduce the temperature, then the pressure is lower, things start to condensate, and the density goes uh, up. Temperature will f uh, go uh, lower even further, so the gas ha is loses its natural ability to re-expand due to pressure effect, and you have thermal instability. So then we put the whole thing on a two-dimensional grid and randomly uh, perturb the flow. And this is what we end up with that you have condens lots of uh, uh, condensations. As they fall in, they stretch. And then with, uh, with, uh, with time, you will see that more and more regions of low density, high temperature will try to uh, buoyantly rise up. So the simple Bondi solution, once you allow for uh, well understood physical processes, when you include them, turns into a relatively time dependent uh, solution. Mm -hmm. Just the heating and cooling, not pressure yet. Okay. Yeah, just a, just a next step, so step by step. How does this compare to Baray-Praga? So this is, we are talking about uh, Baray-Praga and Mag Magamini. So this is the follow-up work using uh, grid-based code zeros instead of uh, SPH. We just found that with SPH, you, uh, the, because of the uh, intrinsic uh, noise, you cannot control the amplitude or location of the perturbation because it's perturbed by design. Okay. So this is to be able to measure the growth rate and compare it with theory. So it is uh, uh, basically a follow-up work on that. Velocity direction. So it's another manifestation. So here we have a thermally uh, 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 unstable phase then it turns in, into, uh, uh, then basically what we uh, you will see is the convec uh, convective phase, that you run out of very dense gas and then you will start seeing big bubbles going up, which is, it, it's not surprising whatsoever, knowing what type of physics entered this calculation. Excuse me? Uh, Initially, it was somewhere here. So we were perturbing the gas all over the place, but in particular outside the sonic point. So the condensations had time to become unlinear before they entered the. the uh. And the important point over here is that with, as time goes on, we see filaments, but then they break into clouds, smaller features, which are then carried out by uh, buoyantly raising hot gas. And that, for me, is something that I would refer to as hitchhiking gas, something that Norm Murray was talking about in a relatively different context. Okay. So you have solutions like that. You see a cloud. So how about the cloud? How can you study clouds like that? Can we trust clouds in global simulations like I just showed you? Uh, is everything well resolved? Do we include all the needed uh, physics? So this is another step. This is with uh, uh, Jan Fay and Tim and Jim and Shane. We use different techniques to address the issue of cloud irradiation. Okay. So the, the main thing over here is, this is coming to your question. Now let's do it as self-consistently self as we can. We have radiative heating and cooling uh, uh, processes. We, in, we included them uh, in um, uh, equation of energy. Now let's add 
opacity and add the source term to the momentum equation in classical uh, uh, field theory, okay? S where you only had pressure uh, uh, forces in, in the typical linear analysis of the instability, okay? So what do we have? We have self-consistently calculated radiation force in an optically thin limit both for continuum and even the most opaque lines in here, okay? And this is kind of, I'm using the same kind of approach as I did for quasars, that I have a given luminosity L, F U V is the fraction in the U V, and F uh, X is in a, uh, uh, which is actually uh, 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 in a different form. So we have, so th these three equations you find in, in Fields paper, but he did not consider this force. He considered magnetic fields at some uh, part. He had heating and cooling and uh, thermal conduction, but we added this, okay? So nonlinear phase is such that densities, uh, density contrasts are uh, of order of 10 or even more. And then what we found, which is very nice, and it's a proof how good Athena code is and if it's handled uh, well that you can uh, we can reach a steady state where all the heating and cooling processes in this case radiative red uh, uh, thermal conduction and advection balance each other that there is no evolution whatsoever of energy f uh, 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 internal energy and we have a s and but the gas is accelerated So this is an illustration. It's maybe hard to follow, but I will show it a few times. So what we say here is we have a gas which is thermally stable. I think it's thermally stable sitting here. And let's say luminosity of the source dropped by a factor of, say, two. Then this gas will undergo constant uh, density perturbation from here to there, it will find itself in, in, in non-firm uh, equilibrium, so it will cool, reach this place, but in this place it's thermally unstable, so you have uh, some part of the gas moving to the left, it will be cooled down, condensate, some part will be heated up. So what we have here We plot results from 1D analog of this, and then with two colors, everything overlaps here I initially. Uh, when we do the slide uh, marked by the uh, blue uh, arrow here, that's the blue part, and the greenish part. So what you see initially is a realization of um, one, uh, it's, it's basically <coughs> an analog of uh, 1D calculation and we try to do it in 2D, but as little modifications as possible. So we perturb the gas along the x-axis, but also um, y-axis, but the perturbation in, in the y-axis was of smaller amplitude, so the growth in the y-axis was slower. So formally, you first you form a slab, okay? This is the configuration that is being used by observers who interpret the data using X-ray or uh, sorry, extra or cloudy calculation. So you, f s j radiation comes from the left. Yes, radiation is very simple. So it's a basically putting 1D calculations onto a 2D grid and, per and the only difference is that we added perturbation in the Y direction. If we wouldn't perturb in the Y direction, it would be just boring slab hole. But in 2D, you, as you probably already noticed, after formation of a slab, the slab is subject to uh, uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability, and it is destroyed very quickly. But nevertheless, accelerated. So this shows uh, uh, location. Uh, this is in a co-moving frame of the slab, so that's why do you don't see the the movement. But the basically, what we have here is band uh, periodic boundary conditions. So you see these three lines over there do not overlap anymore. OK, 
Okay, so you can explore different cases with electron scattering only, with X-ray only, with lines. We explored all four of them. Okay, we can measure the cloud velocity as a function of time for these different cases. What is important here is that acceleration is variable, meaning when the cloud is still hot, it has very little opacity, it is accelerated only because of the electron scattering. When it is material enters this region where opacity uh, quickly goes up, that corresponds to uh, uh, accessing new sources of opacities, acceleration is very high, but then the gas starts to be dispersed because of instabilities, density goes down, acceleration is suppressed. In 1D, you don't have destruction of the cloud, so dotted lines show 1D analog. You see that you can accelerate the gas to basically an arbitrary velocity. Very good. So part two, it's let's abandon the assumption of, uh, uh, of optically thin and go to optically thin, thick. The price is that we will just do a gray uh, 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 opacity. We won't be able to include lines, but it was work with Yan Fei. So then you self, uh, uh, solve everything uh, self consistently. You have radiation, hydrodynamical calculations with Athena, with all the modules developed by Shane and Yan Fei. And then this is just a gallery, just exploration. What do you expect if you have different sources of opacities and different optical depths? So I divided this into two cases motivated by physics, pure scattering. So this is case one, two columns and different times which are marked here. Also radiation coming from the left, okay? So when the cloud is optically thin and subject to uh, scattering only, it is being accelerated with relatively little deformation because the force is uniform. So it is not totally optically thin, it has to be, it has to have some optical depth, otherwise you will not feel the radiation force. So eventually it is deformed. If the opacity is larger, you, then the radiation force is only felt by one side of the cloud. So the cloud is first squeezed and then eventually pushed and accelerated, but the force is acting on the surface only. So it is as if it's being punched. If you now make opacity which is dominated by absorption, but the gas is optically thin, basically a cloud behaves like a bomb. If you can deliver radiation and heat up the gas on the time scale shorter than sound crossing time, the cloud has no time to react to the fact that it is now hotter than it used to. So what you find here, it is heated up and then almost uh, 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 spherically ex uh, expands, okay? If the cloud is optically thick, then we have a totally different uh, situation. The illuminated part uh, is heated and only that part, then it is evaporating, gas is escaping to the left. There's a shock driven to the cold part of the cloud and it is uh, compressed and then you have something that um, uh, Spitzer and Ord mentioned in 1954, you expect so-called the rocket effect in a cloud that because gas is escaping to the left due to Newton, because of Newton's laws, it is moving to the right. This effect is present there, but it's not the dominant in terms of pushing the gas. The most important thing over here is to note that the cloud is destroyed before it, is, it manages to travel distance uh, comparable to its size. So when you start with the pre-existing cloud and you want to irradiate it, you cannot, ac uh, the, uh, the way to accelerate, uh, uh, it's not, it's very hard to accelerate the cloud. The previous scenario that I showed you in optically thin case, it's much more promising because you are accelerating thermally unstable gas when, when the clouds are accelerated as they are being formed. These are, uh, no, these are the clouds where, uh, uh, um, which, where, where the gas is ionized. Okay, so this is a movie of pure scattering case. So with uh, Athena, you can basically plot all the important uh, variables uh, and 
and analyze them one by one. So let me go back. So what is important here, this is the density, this is the temperature. Initially, the gas is in pressure equilibrium, so it's uniform. And this is uh, intensity, to, so you see this, that this gas is uh, not transparent, that it casts a shadow. Okay, so you see that the shadow grows. So these are observational consequences. So that was optically thick, pure scattering case. This is the case where absorption dominates. So you saw that, you see it now why I call it a bomb. And this is the case when you will see a rocket effect and evaporation and irradiation. So you saw that the uh, shadow was very strong. You are heating up, temperature is still low inside. The gas cloud is evaporating. The cold phase is compressed. Then it will re-expand and starts to move, but also spreads uh, sideways. And the shadow gets broader, but then it will disappear somewhere in the middle because you uh, move all the material from the center. Excuse me? Oh, shock heated. My plan is to come back with the cases with magnetic field. But it's not when the, the simulations are done, but when I am ready to talk about it, okay. which can be different by area or two. So you will do it when you are ready? Yes. <laughs> Another complication, keeping things simple but complicating them one by one. Instead of irradiating the, uh, the cloud by a, a spherical uh, source, let's put a flat disk, the one that I started with. So then uh, the radiation is uh, more, the, there's more radiation in direction perpendicular to the disk than the direction along the disk due to simple geometrical foreshortening. Okay. Speaking how things can be complicated. Okay, so what will happen when the source is flat? So this is relatively old stuff I've done in uh, uh, 2007. So over there when the luminosity is high and you have X-rays and UV 50-50, then in this geometry you have inflow over here because gas feels very little radiation and an outflow this way, okay? When you change the ratio, you have mostly in the UV, you don't hit the gas as much and an outflow is very narrow, okay? For some of you over there, you don't see it even. It's only here. This greenish line. Okay. I pause here and congratulate myself that I did not use the term uh, check. Okay. And then you can make the measurements which are most relevant to AGN feedback. You have input of radiative energy, you have an outflow, and you can measure mass fluxes in and out and net. You can measure, measure the uh, uh, energy fluxes, thermal and kinetic. And what is important, and this is just an illustration, to note over here that this very narrow outflow, being very dense, it's actually carrying a lot of en uh, material uh, 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 to the outer part. So what you see here that the in inflow rate is a strong function of radius. So it's decreasing as we go inward. So obviously, because it's a steady state, outflow rate is increasing with radius. So only 10% of what originally started on its journey to the black hole reaches it. The other 90% is expelled. This outflow is dominated by uh, mechanical energy. The en because this gas is cold, its thermal energy is very small. So you can make things much more complicated and fun. You can add radiation. You can add x-ray background and see effects of that. 
it's really uh, complex. You know, you, you have something that you've seen before, okay? So centrifugal barrier prevents gas from reaching this region. So when you add rotation, you, you create an outflow over here, which fragments. So you can say, well, maybe it's relevant to this, right? The cheesy joke is it's even better when you do this. Okay? So you can calculate things in 3D, allowing for the uh, uh, fragmentation of the cloud in azimuthal direction. And then you can go back and calculate spectra now at different inclination angles, but also at different phi's looking at the source because it's fully th three dimensional dimensional okay so now you can make connections with observations that are taken you know uh, in the UV part by stis and, and and other instruments okay you can measure the mass uh, supply rate as a function of uh, luminosity so this is all the things that uh, are relevant for AGN feedback. So at the end of the day, the goal and hope is that you can have a list of your processes going on inside the galaxy, uh, AGN wind, young stars, X -ray, AGN X-ray, and what I talked about, just two of them, then, then you ask a question. Where do they operate and what do they do to the galaxy? So with Professor Ostrich and Luca Ciotti, we have explored that uh, a, a while back. And the conclusion there was that AGN winds heat and in falling gas and limit the growth of the black hole and X-ray heating from the AGN heats the cooling flow and drives galactic winds. So these are my conclusions and I it's time for me to finish. So a significant fraction of the inflow matter can be expelled by radiation and heating. Non-rotating flows settle down to a steady state. The rotation is basically adding time variability. And then you uh, create the clouds, which I hope are related to what we uh, have in narrow or broadline regions. This whole thing may be even relevant to so-called warm absorbers extensively studied by uh, X-ray uh, uh, observatories. And this business of inflow outflow is quite robust, but you, have, uh, you can expect equatorial inflow and bipolar outflow, but details can be very complicated, especially if you add uh, optical depth effects, rotation, radiation force. So mass supply doesn't uh, have to be limited at large radii. So you can have situation that on parsec scale or may maybe a fraction of a parsec, the supply rate is higher than Eddington. And then uh, large scale outflows are in, uh, efficient in removing energy, very, very good in removing matter. So if you want to remove a lot of energy, you I think have a, a better chance doing it by uh, uh, um, uh, disc wind, and I finish here. Thank you very much.